beautiful windy Sunday morning. It's not I don't I don't know if it's as bad as it was yesterday afternoon, but wow. There's some wind outside. So um, as you came in today in the foyer, there um, it is the beginning of April. Wow, first Sunday in April. And um, we have a little newsletter that has upcoming dates. Also has a QR code that will send you straight to our um, webpage. And um, that, that has our calendar. And so this just has a few dates on it, but our um, website has every every date on there. So I really encourage you on the on the way out today, um, just in the foyer, grab one of those newsletters. And if you are a first time guest, um, there is usually a little QR code on the back of some of the the chairs. And that QR code will send you to our webpage, and there's a connection card on there. And we would love um, to stay connected with you. So um, there's also a physical one out in the foyer um, if you would like to do that also. But we are so thankful you are here. Let's all stand today, and um, let's just take a deep breath. Everybody just take a deep breath. Sometimes getting to church is a little hectic, and I get that. Um, but the Lord is here, and is, He is wanting to meet with us today. He is wanting to speak to your heart. Um, he's wanting you to know how much you are loved. And so today, God, we just, we take a moment. And God, we breathe you in today. We breathe in, God, your peace and your joy. And Lord, we ask that today, in this just hour and a half that we set aside, right now, if there is one that does not know you, that they would not leave here today without knowing your incredible, awesome love. God, we worship you. Give you glory, everyone said. Amen. Let's worship today.
and power for God this morning. Um, I just wanted to share something this morning um, as I was praying last night. Um, you know, so many times um, we have a tendency, maybe not you, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this about me. We have a tendency um, to see the negative things. Like if I was to ask you right now, what are five things that happened this week that just was frustrating? I bet you can name them off just like that. Probably daily. By what day it was. But a lot of times when I when I go to say, okay, God, what is something that I can be grateful for? There are so many things. But why is it that we get in this place of magnifying the problem instead of magnifying our God? We magnify, we magnify these little things in our life that are not even that big. Even, even in comparison, like just leave, leave Jesus out of it just for a minute. They're not even big things today. But when you put it up next to the Lord, it's really not that big of a thing. So today, as we sing this next song, I want you to just magnify our way maker, our promise keeper, the one that defends us, the one that fights for us, the one that goes before us. And let's let's not magnify the problem this morning, but let's magnify our Jesus.
don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working.
are so good. There is none like you this morning. What a powerful, powerful Savior we serve. I would like for our prayer team to come. At this time, there'll be a couple in the front, a couple in the back. I want to read some scriptures. In Daniel chapter 3, some of you may be familiar with the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and how, um, you know, they were told they had to bow and that they had to, um, when the music was played, they had to bow and, and worship and they said, no, we will not worship anyone. But um, in, in verse 16, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Neb Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you. I just love how they say this. Your majesty, that we will never serve your gods, nor worship the gold statue that you have set up for us. And then it, it goes on, you know, the king was so mad because, first of all, if you read this, they were respectful in what they said. They said, your majesty, you know, they were, they were, they were very, but it made him so mad that someone would defy him. And so, of course, we know if you've read in, in Daniel that they were thrown into the fire. Okay, did God save them from that? No, they were actually thrown in, right? They thought, I mean, in my mind, if I pray and I have faith, okay, surely God's not going to put me in the fire. But, but God did because there would be more glory at the end. And it says right here um, that... Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. But suddenly, the king jumped up in amazement and exclaimed, didn't we tie three men and throw them into the furnace? And everybody was like, yes, yes, your majesty, we certainly did. But look, the king said, I see four men unbound walking around in the fire unharmed. And the fourth looks like a god. But it was our God. And so this morning, I don't know what you're walking through. I, I honestly don't. I know some of you, I know some of you are walking through a hard time. Some of you may be asking God, God, I prayed that you would remove this from me. I asked you to not let me walk through this. But he is with you. Okay, just like he was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, he is with you this morning. I want you to get that. This song that we're about to sing, um, it talks about there's another in the fire, and he's standing right next to you. Maybe you feel like you can't go on. That's okay, because that's why he's there. He will carry you this morning. So throughout this next song, maybe you have something in, in your life that you need prayer over. That's what this time is for. Our prayer team members, there's two in the front, two in the back. They will go to battle with you this week. They will pray with you. And so I encourage you, um, know that he is near always. But there is also a body of believers that wants to link arms with you today and do life with you.
name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things I've seen and this reckoning. for the ones sick, for the ones, God, struggling mentally and emotionally this morning, that you would be there for them, that you would be their rock, that you would be their, their refuge. God, I just, I worship your name today. You are so good. You are a good father. You are a good friend to us. And God, I pray as the remainder of this service continues, Lord, that you would be known to every single heart and every single life. We worship you. We thank you. In your name we pray. Everyone said amen. Kids will be in here. Nursery is available. Amen. You glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Amen. It's good to see everybody here. I'm so thankful that you are back with us this morning. Had a wonderful Easter service, uh, and uh, so good to see everybody again. Uh, we, we've got a special guest speaker with us this morning. He's going to come and uh, speak to us and uh, share with us what, what the ministry that God has him in and what God is doing uh, through his life and, and, and what God is doing through uh, Teen Challenge um, and, uh, here, in, here in the state of Kansas and, and, and around the globe even. Uh, and so uh, if you would at this time, go ahead and, and welcome Darren Gillespie, if you would. My name is Darren Gillespie. I'm the executive director of Adult and Teen Challenge of Kansas in Wichita. What drew me to the Teen Challenge program was when I was a drug addict myself, in complete desperation. I was a heroin addict, crack cocaine addict. I had reached my bottom. All the dope was gone. All the drugs was gone. Living homeless on the streets, and I walked up to my mom's work, but she handed me an article. She said, here, you need to read this article. It was a newspaper article about Teen Challenge in Memphis. Something just hit me. I, I need to call. I've been clean since 2001, which is a total of 23 years. Teen Challenge is a unique program in a way where Jesus is the center. When you're helping men find freedom, you have to help them understand that they've got to get out of their selves. It's not all about them but it's about help and serve. That's one of the key components at Teen Challenge is us getting out in the community, serving our community, serving to others that are less fortunate. And 
making an impact. And I know in a lot of other programs, you know, that's not the key piece. It could be medication. It could be antidepressants. It could be whatever. I mean, but we see them come off medications and be made whole through the word of God. The mom, the dad, the husband, the wife who are at home while their loved ones in the program. And so when their loved ones come into our program to visit, things like that, it's mandatory that they go through a family class. So we're educating the families. And there's a lot of other programs out there that are not doing that. They're strictly focusing on the individual and not the whole family unit. Adult and Teen Challenge is a tried and true solution to the drug epidemic here in America and around the world. Since 1958, we've been privileged to witness the transformation of tens of thousands of lives through the power of Jesus Christ. Adult and Teen Challenge is excited to bring this life-changing ministry to Kansas. Each of our campuses in the region provide a safe environment where men, women, and adolescents seeking restoration are equipped to overcome the most challenging struggles. Students in our residential program attend classes tailored to those dealing with life controlling issues, gain valuable vocational training, and even have the opportunity to obtain their GED. Experienced staff and pastors are available around the clock to offer support and guidance to students focusing on their spiritual growth and developing healthy life skills. Once the student has completed their year-long program and the staff feels confident the student has gained freedom from addiction, the restored individual can learn how to implement those skills they've acquired back in the world. If all this sounds too good to be true, just remember that with man some things are impossible, but with God all things are possible. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. We have 240 teen challenges within the United States, and we also have teen challenges in 115 different countries around the world. Churches is, is a key component, really, to teen challenge, I feel, because, you know, teen challenge is considered a parachurch ministry. You know, we're a place for pastors to send people to as well as a resource. We don't turn anybody away that doesn't have any money. Although we do have an induction fee and a monthly tuition fee, if a family comes to us and they don't have any money, we're going to work with them. We ask the churches to support us on a monthly basis. We also have businesses in, in the community that believe in Teen Challenge. So it's not about one denomination. It's about Jesus Christ. And he's the one that brings healing and hope to an individual who's struggling with drug addiction and alcoholism. I remember I started experimenting with cocaine, methamphetamines. PCP was my drug of choice. It was always that hold on me that it had on me because that was my way of escape. Growing up a mom with an addict, I started taking pills with her at a young age. Soon the pills turned into alcohol. I just felt like I couldn't stop. I lived in depression, didn't feel like I could go out in public, didn't feel like I could function like a normal human being. I developed an anxiety disorder that made me pull out my hair. I had a really bad eating disorder and I dealt with self-harm. I was at that point when I came to these doors. I didn't see days ahead of me. I just took it one day at a time. This is life or death for me. So when I came here and I met all these other women who had similar stories or worse than mine, I felt like I was at home. I felt like it was safe for me to be myself. I'm grateful to this program and what it's done for me because the people here who never turned their back on me, I'm just gonna be the best man that I could possibly be for everyone around me. That's my prayers. I'm gonna continue to pray on that. Amen. Amen. Well, before I get started, I'd just like to say thanks to Pastor Justin and, and, and Tribune Assembly of God. Thank you for having me out uh, this morning. Uh, so appreciate that. This is my passion. This is my heart of, of what God's called me to do, and that's to help people that are, you know, battling drug addiction and alcoholism. Um, but it's my wife's heart, too, and I have her with me this morning. If I could, just have you stand up. This is my wife, Tracy, and I have two, two daughters that weren't able, weren't able to make it this morning. They, have a, they wanted to go to their church back in Wichita, and we understand that, and so we don't want to keep them from, from their home church. But, but anyway, as I said, this is my heart. This is my passion. 
Um, through the video, you may have heard uh, a little bit of my testimony of how God changed my life through the ministry of Teen Challenge many, many years ago, over well, 23 years ago. I walked through the doors of Teen Challenge severely addicted, drug, dr drug addiction, alcoholism. You know, I was severely addicted to, to heroin, crack cocaine, and God used the ministry of Teen Challenge to help change my life. You know, I've been blessed to be a part. I walked in the doors, like I said, you know, strung out. Um, and then, you know, after God began to do a work in my life through the ministry of Teen Challenge, I decided to stay with Teen Challenge. I decided that that was what God was calling me back to do, uh, is to help other men and see, and, and those that are struggling with addiction find freedom as well. And so, so but... You may have heard Teen Challenge started back in 1958 by a man named David Wilkerson. How many of you, well, first of all, let me ask you this. How many of you are familiar with Teen Challenge in here? Okay, amen, quite a few of you. Well, Teen Challenge is a 12-month residential faith-based drug and alcohol recovery program for uh, adult men, adult women, adolescent boys, and adolescent girls. So we have programs for all age groups and gender. Um, and as I said, Teen Challenge started back in 1958 by a man named David Wilkerson. And, you know, it, it, I, I look at that story and how uh, David Wilkerson, he was a young Assembly of God minister uh, in, in rural Pennsylvania who had a mandate. God had, there had been a, a, murder, a murder trial that had happened or that was going on in New York City about some young kids who had killed a man named Michael Farmer. He was a polio actually a polio victim, but these gang members had murdered this young, young boy. And this young Assembly of God minister, David Wilkerson, you know, God spoke to him and he said, hey, I want you to go intervene and try to help those, those boys who've committed this murder. And David Wilkerson was like, man, you know, and, and, but yet he did. He packed his stuff up, drove to New York City. He intervened on the court case. And, and what was kind of like what blew me away the most was is that when he when he walked into the courtroom he bust in this courtroom and he just says I'm here to, to to speak to these young men and try to help them you know and and but the but the judge threw him out of the courtroom I mean he got escorted out of the courtroom which is kind of crazy you know you think about a pastor busting in on a on a murder trial in New York City and he gets escorted out he probably could have gone to jail but they didn't arrest him you know and, uh, but that's radical, man. When you, you know, you think about it, when you've got a mandate from God on your life and he's calling you to go do something, it could be radical, right? And so, but we have to obey and do what God's called us to do. And he did that. And because he did that, you know, we now have two, about, well, over 240 teen challenges within the United States and teen challenges in, in 115 different countries around the world. And so Teen Challenge is making an impact. You know, every day around the world, drug and alcohol addiction is wreaking havoc of catastroph catastrophic proportions. Marriages break up. Families are destroyed. A child's future is set at risk. Jobs are lost. Countless drug-related act acts of violence happen. And the potential of yet another life is never fulfilled. The ripple effect of addiction and the cost to society is incalculable. Governments have been fighting the war on drugs for decades now, and drugs seem to be winning. In the midst of overwhelming devastation, Adult and Teen Challenge is a first hope responder to individuals and families and communities. Adult and Teen Challenge believes in second chances. Our purpose is to facilitate life transformation for boys, girls, men, and women whose lives have been affected by issues like anger, rebellion, depression, drug use, and or abuse of other life-controlling problems. We believe that providing our students with a fresh perspective, they will have the opportunity to realize their potential and reach their dreams. You know, when we, we hear about drug addiction and alcoholism, there's so many today that, that there's families that are dealing with that. You know, they either know somebody, or there's somebody in their immediate family, or there may be somebody here today that's dealing with some type of addiction. See, sometimes addictions, we don't recognize them because we're good at masking those things. And uh, a lot of times we never know the struggle of what's going on inside a person's life. 
But sometimes, sooner or later, it begins to manifest in a person's life and it begins to show because you can only maintain your addiction for so long. And then it overcomes and it overcomes your life. And people recognize that. You know, a lot of times we don't recognize that until somebody makes it aware. You know, like I, I remember in my life, you know, in my addiction, you know, it wasn't, I just never really thought anything about it until it got really bad. And, you know, I saw him, and I began to struggle, but it, people began to, you know, my family and people began to do interventions in, in, in my life and like, Darren, you've, you've got a problem. You need to get your life together. I mean, this is not normal the way you're living. You know, I come from a good family. And uh, my dad was a cop for 30 years. And so, you know, imagine that. My, my dad being a police officer, being rest, arrested most of my adult life, in and out of jail, embarrassing him on the police department. Um, and I come from a big city, Memphis, Tennessee. And, uh, and so that was my lifestyle. But we never know what a person's going through. And so Teen Challenge is, is a program for, for just that, people who are struggling. We, we are a faith-based program. Jesus Christ is the center. So, you know, in, I, in my, the years of my addiction, I went through several secular rehabs probably four or five, and none of those rehabilitation programs worked for me until I met Jesus Christ. It wasn't until I was introduced to Jesus. He was my hope. He became my hope. He was my Savior. He brought me out and changed my life. And so, you know, once I, once I graduated Teen Challenge, I felt called back, called back into the ministry. Uh, I'm actually an Assembly of God minister myself. I went, went to Bible college, got my credentials. But Teen Challenge is a home missions organization, and so highly recognized through the Assembly of God. We are a basically a home missions program through the Assembly of God organization. So the Assembly of God organization recognizes us in a in a in a high, in, in a in a highly way, and so um, we would. So my my wife and I, we we got called to uh, Kansas uh, to start and establish an adult men's program. Um, in Wichita, Kansas, and so that's where we're living right now. We moved from Mississippi to there, um, so we're in the process. We've been living here for about eight months now uh, to plant and start this adult men's program. And so, one of the things that that we do is we travel around to churches, you know, sharing about the ministry, the program, us planning it. Eventually, we will have it open. It will be a resource. Um, for anybody that's struggling with addiction and maybe has a, a family member that's struggling as well to, to send to us to be able to help help them get back, help that individual get back on their feet. And so so right now, one of the key components of what we're doing is going from church to church to church, you know, creating an awareness, raising support financially. Uh, you know, we, we need your prayers as well. And so... Um, but with that said, you know, we, uh, I mentioned David Wilkerson, the cross and the switchblade. This, uh, we, have a, we have a table set out in the foyer um, with some literature on it. And this is the cross and the switch, a condensed version of the cross and the switchblade book. And it kind of tells the story of Teen Challenge and how everything happened and, uh, with Nikki Cruz, David Wilkerson. And so these, these are free. Grab one of these when you leave today. Uh, these are really good books for, uh, if you know somebody that's battling addiction, um, a loved one or somebody, grab this book and just say, hey, I've got this little book I'd like for you to read. And it just kind of, I can't tell you how many people that's read this little book right here and gotten saved and realized that, hey, I need help. I need help. I want to find out more about this program. Um, I have uh, also out at the table, we have a brochure that kind of uh, shares a little more about Teen Challenge and us planning and what we're doing. I'm in Wichita, Kansas as well. Um, I have uh, some uh, support cards out there as well. If anybody may feel led to support us, uh, pick up one of these cards as well. But, but I, I want to leave you with some statistics this morning. Um, so 170 Americans under the age of 50 die per day due to opi opioid abuse. Three million die from addiction each year. 100,000 deaths per day, 420 deaths per hour, 7 deaths per minute. 
Only one in ten addicts will seek treatment this year. This is according to the National Institute on Drug Abuse. One in five high school students binge drink. In 2021, there were 435 opioid overdose deaths in Kansas, which accounted for 64% of all drug overdose deaths in the state. From 2011 to 2021, the age-adjusted death rate due to op opioid uh, overdose quadrupled in Kansas. And, you know, I was listening the other day. I mean, I, mean, I, I think most of us recognize that we are a really – you know, we've, we've talked about battling addiction, our government, and all that stuff. And, but I really, truly do believe that today addiction is worse than it's ever been because we have fentanyl pouring over our border, methamphetamines. I mean, but I mean, even, in, even in itself, alcohol is, is, is bad enough. But, but with the fentanyl crisis that's going on, it's really bad. And I, I heard the other day that from the ages of, uh, from the ages of 18 to 43, right now, uh, fentanyl is the leading cause of death over everything from the ages of 18 to 43. It supersedes cancer and alcohol, everything. So we, we actually have a, 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 a true epidemic on our hands. And so Teen Challenge is the place. Adult and Teen Challenge is, is the place to, to send people. That's where, you know, I, I just truly believe I've tried every, all these secular rehab programs and nothing ever worked for me and no, nothing ever happened in my life until I met Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And then, too, um, at the, on the table out there, we have, uh, so we have some handmade crosses out there um, that the men from Teen Challenge make. All those crosses, you can purchase one of those crosses on the way, on the way out. Uh, by purchasing one of those crosses or something out on the table, all the proceeds go back into Teen Challenge. Hey, I so appreciate you guys allowing me to come and share briefly this morning about my passion, my heart, and what we're doing and trying to establish this adult, adult and Teen Challenge in Wichita, Kansas. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you, Darren, for sharing that. It, it's important. Amen? Amen. Uh, missions, missions matter. We've been involved with uh, Teen Challenge before, Victory House out of, out of uh, Brewster. Uh, they, we've had them here several times. Uh, and that, that was a, um, a teen girls. Uh, it was specifically for teen girls. And um, Darren and his family are now here, uh, and, and they're raising up and uh, building or, or trying to find a building, get into some houses and different things, specifically geared towards helping men uh, turn their life around. And it's, it's something that is needed. It's something that is uh, necessary. Uh, and so, Darren, thank you for answering uh, the call. The call to that. We had great conversation before uh, before church and. Um, um, some 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 laughs about some the way we were raised and uh, what he grew up in and from down in Florida and Mississippi and, uh, and different things and um, I don't know if you heard him uh, during uh, during April's uh, exhortation uh, but he was saying come on right did y'all hear that that is uh, that is Southern talk for a man. That is Southern talk for that's good, say it again, say it louder. That's what that means. Uh, and so um, we, I, I like that, brought, brought back memories of growing up in Texas. Um, but amen, we're going to jump into the Word of God this morning. Thank you, Darren, for sharing your heart, what God is doing uh, through, through Teen Challenge, and what He's going to do through Teen Challenge here in the state of Kansas. Um, after service this morning, we'll, we'll be having a missions trip, informational meeting. Uh, in the Family Life Center, so be aware of that. If you're going on the missions trip, be there, be in the Family Life Center uh, after service. Last week, for a vast majority of churches, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, it was last week was kind of the Super Bowl 
for a lot of churches. Easter. Easter is one of the biggest attended services in our nation. Uh, and, and so you have people coming to service that typically don't come to church. Uh, and, and we had that. We, have some folk, we had some folks that were, that were here that don't typically come to church. And, and, and God spoke to hearts and lives. And God ministered and He strengthened and, and, and He encouraged. And I'm so thankful uh, that, that for the life change that took place, not just here, uh, but took place on a, on a global scale. Uh, and... and I know a lot of churches that, that were reporting of, of the lives that were touched and changed through the Word of God. Amen? Amen. And so all, all over the world, you have thousands of people that are coming to faith in Christ. And it's not just happening on Easter or, or, or at Easter service, but it's happening day after day. And, and people are coming to, uh, coming to Christ, not just because of Easter, but because God is moving. Amen? Amen. Because God is moving. But at the very same time as you have so many people coming to Christ, there are many Christians who are deciding to stop following Christ. They're walking away from their Christianity. They're walking away from their relationship with Christ. Why? Why? Honestly, this morning it, it hits home, close to home for myself and probably for uh, some of the others of us because... Those of us that have raised our kids in church, or uh, you've been a youth pastor, or a kids pastor, or or something along those lines, we've we've fed into young people, we've fed into different ones, we've invested time in them, and then as they've grown up, we've watched them walk away from their relationship with Christ. It it hurts. It hurts. Um. And I don't know about you, but, but when, I, when that happens, I've asked myself uh, during those times, is there something different that I could have done? Is there something uh, that I could have said? Is there something that I could have done? Is there something that we as a church could have done? And I wonder, I wonder might we as Christians, might we consider that, that we potentially, that there might be something that we're doing wrong, that we're doing wrong. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 14. I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 14, and as you make your way there, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you, Lord, for the worship and for your presence uh, that is here, that is ministering and moving. Thank you, Father, for, for Darren and his family and, and God moving their family from Mississippi to, to Wichita, Kansas, so that life change can happen uh, in the hearts and lives of men who, who, who find themselves in the grip of addiction. God, I pray, Father, that the remainder of this time, Lord, that, that you would anoint me. God, that you would help me. Father, that you would hide me behind your cross. Lord, may they see and hear only you this morning. Have your way in this service, I pray. Have your way in this message. In your precious name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 14. In this chapter, we will find that the disciples have found themselves in a boat. Christ has just got done ministering and talking, and he's, he sent them across uh, the lake. He said, go to the other side. And, and so they're making their way across this lake. And, and it, the Bible tells us that about 3 o'clock in the morning that they find themselves in a, a, a storm of sorts. The wind is picked up. And, and has anybody ever know, have, have you noticed the past few days the wind? Yeah, yeah, you've noticed that. Can you imagine being out on the water in that wind? And the waves that, that it would be causing. And that's what the, the disciples, they found themselves in trouble on this lake that they were in. And the wind had picked up and, and there was big waves that were kicking up against the boat. And, and they were struggling to make their way across this body of water. And it's in the midst of this struggle that Jesus makes his way to them. Walking on the water. And if you can imagine, they're a little bit freaked out, right? It's 3 o'clock in the morning, it's, it's, it's dark, it's pitch black, and, and all of a sudden, something is coming towards them on the water. They're freaked out, they're wigged out, they're, they're terrified. They're terrified. And honestly, if we were to be honest with ourselves this morning... You know, we may smile and we may judge the disciples on that, but if you were in a boat, 
3 o'clock in the morning and you were having trouble finding your way to shore because the waves kept pushing you one direction when you were wanting to go another direction and, and, and you found yourself in this boat at 3 o'clock in the morning, pitch black at night, and something comes floating across the water towards you. We would probably, you would find me in the fetal position at the bottom of the boat. Right? The only reason that we laugh and chuckle and and we judge the disciples is because we have the advantage of reading the story. Right? Peter, they're in this this struggle. They're in this fight. And Jesus calls out to him, don't be afraid. It's, It's just me. It's me. Peter calls out to Jesus. And that's where we're going to pick up the story. Matthew chapter 14, verses 28 through 31, it says, Then Peter called out to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me. Peter shouted, save me, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? You have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? If we're honest this morning, we've all had our spiritual doubts. We've all had our spiritual struggles. We've all had our questions. And maybe this morning you, you're you someone that is here this morning. You're someone that is here or you're watching online and, and you have your doubts. You have your questions and you find yourself in that position this morning. Or maybe you find yourself in the unique position of you're helping somebody walk through their questions. You're helping somebody walk through their doubts, their time of doubt. But if that's you this morning, you're doubting. I want to encourage you, your doubt doesn't disqualify your faith. Amen? Your doubt doesn't disqualify your faith. And and, and in fact, your doubt is often an invitation to a deeper faith, into a deeper walk with Christ. Jesus, in that moment, he asked Peter, why did you doubt me? We've all had our struggles with doubt. I've already said that. And and, and there's a variety. There's a vast amount of different reasons as to why we doubt, why we question, why we struggle. A vast amount of different reasons from from what seems to be like contradictions that we see in the Word of God. You know, we read through a, a passage of Scripture and then we read through another passage of Scripture and it may seem like it contradicts itself or or there's questions in life that we can't answer or 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 we 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 there, there's all these bad things that are happening in our life or all these bad things that are happening in the world around us or Christian leaders that, that fall away or walk away from their relationship with Christ or, or how about this, that when we read the Bible, what we read in the Bible, we don't see happening in the lives of Christians today nor in the church. It's in, these, it's in this moment of doubt that Jesus is holding on and grabbing a hold of Peter and says, why, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? I mean, think about it. Peter, Peter, the, the outspoken disciple, right? The, the one that we've gotten used to, that we've read about. I mean, he, he consistently does what? He sticks his foot in his mouth, right? Consistently. But he's walked with Christ, he's, he, he's, he's seen uh, and sat with Christ and it, when, when he's done miracles, he's, he's heard all the teachings that, that Christ has taught and, and the parables that he's walked people through. And, and, but in this moment, he's walking on the water. Yeah. You ever done that? But Peter's walking on the water, and, and, and the Bible tells us that, that he, his focus shifted, right? His focus shifted, and he, and he saw 
he saw the waves, the strong wind and the waves, and it says that he was terrified. His focus shifted from Jesus to what was going on around him. Why did you doubt? That's the question that Jesus asked him. Why did you doubt? Now, Jesus loved Peter. He loved him. And Jesus doesn't beat Peter over the head. Yes, he asks him a question. And yes, he says, you have little faith, but he doesn't beat him over the head. And you know what else he doesn't do? He doesn't hold his head under the water. He doesn't hold his head under the water and then pick him up and say, do you believe in me now? He doesn't hold his head under the water. He doesn't beat him over the head. He doesn't say, have you learned your lesson yet? No, he, he understood that, that Peter is still in the growing process. He's still in the growing process. And so in this moment, he reaches down and he grabs a hold of Peter. He says, Peter, I love you. I love you. I'm here for you. I, why, why, I'm, I'm here for you. Why did you doubt me, though? We've all had our doubts. We've all had our questions. And if we're not careful, we can take people's questions wrong. We can take people's questions wrong. It's like... Let me make this comparison, if I could. It's like when teenagers begin to question their parents' authority. Okay? When teenagers begin, and, and, and I have a few at home, and so I've walked through this a little bit. But when they begin to question the parents' authority, now when they, when they begin to question it, now, now sometimes there's probably a little bit of sarcasm in there. Right? Anybody ever been there as a teenager? Sometimes when they question, when they ask questions about, well, why do I have to do it that way? Or why can't I go do this? Or whatever the question may be, sometimes there, there might be some disrespect in there, maybe. But maybe at other times they're asking because they want to understand. And if we're not careful, I, myself as a parent, if I'm not careful when they begin to question something that I've told them to do or, or, or something that I've asked them to do, if I'm not careful, I can take their question as an accusation or as a, they're trying to t challenge me, right? And sometimes their questions aren't an invitation, or their, their, their questions aren't, 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 aren't challenged, they're an invitation because they're seeking to understand. And what if we looked at the questions that are being asked by the people in church or outside of church? What if we looked at them as invitations rather than accusations and challenges? What if they ask their question, 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 and, and instead of saying something like, well, you just don't understand. You have to walk with Christ a, a, a longer. You, ha you haven't walked with Christ long enough. You'll understand when you've walked with them, Him long enough. What if they ask their question, and instead of responding like that, we say something like, hey, I hear you. I I'm here for you. I, I, I love you, and I, I want to help you. Let's talk about these questions. Let's walk through these questions. Let's work through these questions. Often when somebody has come to church or is considering Christ and they start questioning the church, and I mean the big C church, they start questioning their faith, the big C church far too often pushes people away instead of embracing them, instead of trying to walk through the questions with them. Instead of being there for them. April and I, when, when we first uh, moved out here um, to pastor over, over 10 years ago, uh, what we, uh, the church that we had came from, there was a bunch of uh, different things that were taught um, and, and, and way, the way that we were raised. And when we got here from, away from, from everybody and everything that we had grown up with and, and everything, we, we really had to begin to ask some questions. We were taught this. Why were we taught this? We had to go to the Bible and we had to examine what we were taught with the filter and run it through the filter of the Word of God. Hear me? We had to run it through the filter of the Word of God. And what we realized and what we, under, what we began to understand is that there were 
things that we were taught that we did growing up because that was a part of the church that we went to. And mom and dad, my mom and dad were in leadership, and her mom and dad were in leadership. And, and if you wanted to be in leadership, well, then you had to do those things. See, my, my southern friend knows what I'm talking about. And, and what God did when we got here is he, be, he really began to walk through it with us of, of, hey, is this me or is this man? Understand what I'm saying? Is this me or is this man? Is this in my word? Have I laid this out for you? And, 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 and God helped us and he placed people in our hearts and lives and, and they helped us walk through that and we answered some very pivotal and important questions for us. What he did is he demoed a belief system that wasn't all based in him. Can I be honest with you this morning? That was very difficult for us to walk through. It was very challenging for us to walk through because of the of people that we had grown up around. How are they going to look at us? What are they, what are they going to say about us? And, and so on and so forth. But what we were doing is we were taking a sincere examination of our beliefs. Seeking to let go of what was untrue and holding on to what was biblical and what was true. And building on that. Amen? And when we do that with others, when we walk others, when we walk with others in that, it's called discipleship. It's discipleship. Jesus does this. He does it throughout the, the, throughout the Gospels. And, and in Matthew chapter 5, we really see it. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 44, it says this. You have heard the law that says, you have heard the law. Pay attention to that. You've heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemy, pray for those that persecute you. Now the law has taught you this, but I'm tearing that down. I'm demoing that. I, that, that doesn't belong there. That's not true. That's not right. I'm tearing that down. This, don't just love your neighbors. Don't just love your friends. Love your enemies. You've been taught. The law has said this. And, and so he, he changes it up. He, he, he demolishes. He tears down what they've been taught for so long. And, and if you were to read the entirety of Matthew chapter 5, it's not in the, just in these two verses, but if you were to read the entirety of Matthew chapter 5, you would see that Jesus does this in this one single chapter. He does it a total of five different times. You have heard, but I say. You have heard, but I say. You, this is what you have been taught, but, but this is what I'm saying is true. This is what I'm saying is right. You've heard it said. So what, it was, what he was doing, he was, he was demoing, he was tearing that, down what they thought was true, and then he was giving them truth to build upon. He does it a lot. Christ does it a lot. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is talking about his death and his burial and his resurrection, and, and, and Peter, it, Peter's like, you know, he's talking about this with Peter and, and the other disciples, and, and Peter, again, opens his mouth, right? Because that's what Peter does. And he says, basically, he says, no way. This isn't going to happen. While you're here and I'm here, I'm not going to allow this to happen. It's not going to happen on my watch. There's no way this is going to happen. And Jesus, Jesus turns to Peter and says, get away from me, Satan. Matthew chapter 16, verse 23, he says, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view and not from God's. He's tearing down Peter's false belief system. Uh, Peter, you thought, you believed I was coming to be a conqueror, a, 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 a human conqueror, and to, and to conquer the, the Roman nation and to set up the, 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 the state of Israel. But, but I came as a servant to serve and to suffer. You believe that I came to win human victory, but I came to be a sacrifice. You're looking at it through a human perspective, but, but I've come to win a great 
a much greater, bigger victory than you understand, Peter. You don't have the ability to understand it right now, but you will. But right now, I need you to shut up and get behind me. Let's let go of what isn't true. Hold on to what is. This morning, church, how do you, what is your belief system built on? How do you build your belief system? Is your belief system built the way that the majority, the vast majority of, uh, of the world builds theirs based off of how they were raised, based off of what experiences they have, based off of how they, the, what community they grew up in or what they were taught in church? Is that how you build your belief system? Or, and, and then on top of that, each and every one of us, we bring, we bring our own filters to the show as well, right? We bring our own filters. We, and instead of reading the Bible uh, like we should, we read the Bible through those filters. Well, Pastor, what are those filters? Well, again, it's how we were raised. How your mom and dad raised you is, is a filter of how you view the world. It's a filter of what you think is right or wrong, the type of church that you grew up in, right? Right? The type of church that you grew up in helps build those filters. Or if there was no church in your life at all, helps build those filters. Uh, I mean, uh, things that happen to us of li- in life, good things, helps build filters. The bad things that we walk through in life, the trauma, the past experiences, all of that stuff, all of that stuff impacts the way we build our belief system, the, the, how we filter things. And, and as we walk through life, we begin to pick up things along the way based on our filters, based on our experiences. And we pick up beliefs about God, some of them true, some of them good, some of them right, some of them not so good. Funny story. Growing up, we, I went to uh, a Christian school and uh, went to several different Christian schools, actually. Um, but at this one Christian school, we, we'd always have uh, chapel, like on Wednesdays, and, um, uh, and the pastor was, a, was an older guy, and, um, and, and so he would, he would preach chapel, he'd preach chapel service, and then on Sunday, he would preach, uh, you know, the Sunday service, and, and one of the ladies was, that went to church there was talking to, to my mom, and her and my mom had gotten close, and, and um, she was just asking her about a bunch of different questions, and so my mom was, was answering uh, one of these questions. Well, I, I was a little bit younger, but I was getting old enough to begin to understand some stuff, and, and um, and began to be interested in what mom and dad was, was talking about. So I was eavesdropping, right? They were having a private conversation. I was, and, 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 and they were talking, and mom was like, mom was like, she was, she, was, she was frustrated. She was exasperated. She was like, how can he teach that? And, and, and all this sort of stuff. And, and what was going on is that the preacher that, that uh, was, was leading this church and, and uh, leading this school is that he began to preach and teach on that tithing was based off, the amount of tithes that you paid was based off of your weight. So either people left the church or they got skinny. One of the two. Right? But that, I mean... She was asking mom, like, well, like, is that in the scripture? Is that what we pick up stuff along the way that, that some of it's good and some of it can be really, really bad? Maybe, just maybe everything that we believe about God may not be true. We have to check it. Amen? We have to filter it and when we discover that something that we believe isn't biblical then then does that mean that we walk away from God does that mean that we just quit quit it all no that means that we let go of what is untrue and we hold to what is true 
we hold to what is biblical. Another story. We're getting close to, well, we're getting, we're closer than what we were to closing. <laughs> Before we became pastor, um, I had a remodeling business, a construction business. And, um, and most of my business toward the end came from, from one individual, that a guy that was buying houses and flipping houses, and, and, and he was doing it pretty quickly. He had three or four crews running, and, and, and so he would buy this house, and then he would put together everything that he wanted to remodel inside the house, take out some walls, new cabinets, flooring, whatever it would be. And so I would give him a bid on, on everything that he wanted to do and everything that he wanted done, and then we would haggle over that price. Uh, and, and then we, we would come to a terms, and we'd sign the contract, and me and my team, we'd, we'd take off, and we'd begin the, the remodel. And the very first house that he, that he had me remodel, I walked into, and he gave me a scope of work of everything that he wanted done. And, and, and I had a conversation with him, and it went like this. Tear the house down. It's terrible. Like you got to, you know, and I, I just, I was like, it's a piece of junk. And, and, and what he had done is he had ran all the numbers of what it would cost to remodel it and do everything that he wanted to do. And, and, but what he could sell it for when he got it all done. And he ran the numbers and he realized, I can make a pretty good chunk of change. The housing market, all that sort of stuff. And so what I found out over time, over my time of working with him and remodeling these, these different houses and, and seeing how, uh, how business was, was done and how he was doing business is, was done is, is that I, what I realized is that if the house was built right, it could be remodeled time and time again. And it would still hold value. If it was built right, and what I mean by that is that not everything in the house needed to be torn down. Not everything. It, it, it had good stuff. Yes, there was some bad parts. Yes, there was some damaged parts. Yes, there was some things that needed to be redone, but the whole house wasn't bad. Well, Pastor, what are you getting at? What I'm getting at is when you discover that something that you've believed isn't true, that doesn't mean that you have to tear it all down and start over again. It doesn't mean that it's, that it's all been for naught and that you have to walk away. No, you stop believing what isn't true and you hold on to what is true and you continue, continue to pursue after what is true and you build upon what is true. You build upon what is good. You focus on Him. Remember, back in Matthew when we talked about Peter, the whole reason that he began to sink is because he got his focus on something else. You focus, you put your focus and you keep your focus on what is good and what is right. You read the Bible through the lens of Jesus' love, not through the lens of how I was raised or the experiences that I've walked through or the things that I've done. Listen, church, our, our goal as a church, our goal as a church shouldn't be that we, we want to win the argument or that we want to be right when people doubt or question. That shouldn't be our goal. Yes, we want to have solid beliefs. Yes, we want to, to be firm and we want to have a good foundation and we want to believe the truth, but it shouldn't be that we want to be right in the argument because you can be right but still be wrong. Our goal should be to love people. And when they begin to question when they begin to doubt, when they begin to, 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 to wonder, when they're in a crisis moment of questioning, we're there and we let them know, hey, I'm here. God loves you. We're going to walk through this. We're going to get through this together and things are going to be right. We don't have to tear it all down. Peter, we talk about Thomas the doubter. I like to call Peter the doubter too. Peter the doubter, just a short while later, stands up in front of people. In fact, he stood up in front of a large group of people on the day of Pentecost and he declared what is right and what is true because he had walked through some doubt. And on that day, 3,000 people gave their heart and life to Christ. 3,000 people were saved because Peter didn't walk away. 
Peter, the one that Jesus grabbed a hold of as he was sinking into the water because of his doubt. Peter, the one that Jesus looked at and said, get behind me, Satan. Preached a message where 3,000 people gave their heart and life to Christ. Doubt doesn't disqualify your faith. Doubt, questioning, doesn't disqualify your faith because doubt isn't the enemy of faith. In fact, doubt can be an invitation to a deeper faith. Peter knew what it was like to be forgiven. And years later, he writes this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25. He writes, he says, Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. Peter knew firsthand the love, the mercy of a good shepherd. He knew the love and the mercy of a good shepherd that had laid down his life for his sheep. Amen? Laid down his life for you and for me. So this morning, church, I ask you this question. What are your beliefs built on? What are your beliefs built on? If somebody is doubting, somebody is questioning, that doesn't disqualify you doesn't mean you walk away or have to walk away. If you're, if you're in the midst of walking through a crisis moment with somebody where they're questioning, where, where they're doubting, be there for them. Love them. Love them in the midst of that. Love them through that. Answer their questions. They're not challenging the Word of God. They want to understand. Amen? They want to understand. Stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning and we worship you. We thank you and we worship you. God, every single one of us this morning, every single one of us this morning, we've had our questions. We've had our crisis moments, some of us longer than others, where we've doubted where we've questioned those crisis moments of of faith. And God, you didn't walk away from us in in those moments. You didn't beat us over the head in those moments. You, like Peter, you, you reached down and you grabbed us and you helped us through it. God, you've walked, April and I, you've walked with us through some very difficult times of questioning and doubting where, Father, things were up in the air for us. We didn't understand. We we were questioning everything. And it was you who was there every step of the way guiding us back to your word, showing us what was true and what was good, what is good and what is true. So, Father, this morning, if there's someone under the sound of my voice, if there's someone that is watching online and they find themselves in a a crisis moment, Father, they're questioning or they're they're doubting their faith, God, that's not a a time to just turn and walk away. No, it's a time to dig in. That's a time to keep asking questions, to keep seeking, because you will be there to answer. And God, you will place people in their lives. You will place people in their lives that will help them in those moments. God, for the rest of us, for those of us that may not be questioning this morning, that that we may not be doubting this morning, Father, may we be those people. Help us, Lord, to be those people that, that when somebody finds themselves in those moments, God, that we are there to say, hey, I'm here, ask your question. I, I love you. I want to help you. I want to strengthen you in this moment and help us to direct them, Father, to your word, to what you say in your word. Father, you've placed those people in my life. You've been faithful to do that in in my life, and God, I know you'll be faithful to do it in theirs as well. God, help us. Father, whether we're questioning this morning, whether we're doubting this morning, or whether, whether we're helping others walk through it, help us, Father, to run things through the filter of your word. And not the filter of how we were raised or the experiences that we walked through. Through the filter of your word, the love of Jesus. 
God, I thank you for Darren. I thank you for Tracy, his wife, his family, for the calling that you've placed upon them. God, I pray, God, that you would open doors, that you, you would provide, you're going to provide abundantly, Father, for the needs, because this is a ministry that is needed in the state of Kansas. God, I pray, for the, Father, that you would anoint him, that you would bless him and his family. God, as they go from this place, keep your hand of protection upon them. Keep your hand of protection upon us. God, may you turn your face, our direction, turn your countenance upon us. And God, give us blessing and peace as we go from this place. We worship you. We thank you. In your precious name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. You are dismissed. Go in the blessing and in the grace of the Lord this morning.